I would like to I would like to start by um, talking about a, another conference I was at uh, not not too long ago, also on genetic technology. Um, it was a sub conference on the subject of gene patenting. And sitting at the table with us was Robert George, a Princeton University professor. And he told a story that illustrates well, I think, the ethical climate that we face today. Dr. George was describing an ethics course that he teaches where his students were discussing a host of contentious social issues such as whether we should allow surrogate motherhood, whether we should allow the sale of children, and so on. Uh, to his surprise, the students in his class were all against these things, solidly, solidly, firmly, every single one of them. As he put it, this was a pretty much an anything goes crowd, as Princeton University students mostly are. And yet every one of them was opposed to things like surrogate motherhood and the sale of children. But then when he pressed his students to give reasons for their opposition, to support what they felt, they had nothing to say. They sort of muttered and stumbled and, and couldn't come up with anything. In other words, they had a visceral sense that certain things were right and wrong, but they didn't have the principles to argue for their, for their views or to support them. This is a microcosm, I would suggest, of what we face across the culture today. To some degree, many people instinctively sense what's right and wrong. They sense instinctively that genetic technology, for example, could be a potentially a great good, but also potentially a great danger. Many people would insist that certain uses of, moral te of ethical technology, of genetic technology, are morally wrong. But if you ask them to give reasons for their visceral sense of moral boundaries, they can't do it. They can't offer any rational ground. Robert Bella, in his book, Habits of the Heart, shows this so poignantly and shows that most Americans' vocabulary doesn't even give them the language to express the idea of an objective morality. So what does this mean for us today as we try to be salt and light in our culture? I have to coin a phrase. There's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that on moral issues, we often can find common ground with non-believers. On the basic level of human experience, that visceral sense of right and wrong, we often have a point of contact with non-believers as we engage them over the life and death issues that we'll be discussing at this conference. The bad news is that on a conceptual level, most Americans today have no rational ground for their moral intuition. They lack a vocabulary even to speak of an objective morality. In fact, the vocabulary that is available to them is antithetical to the idea of objective moral. And this is the level I want to address today. If we're to fight the culture war effectively, we must realize that the liberal mindset has no resources within itself to generate moral guidelines for the use of genetic technology. What this means is that before we discuss specific ethical questions, which we'll be raising through the rest of the conference, we also have to understand the liberal worldview as an integrated system of thought, as a complete worldview, and contrast it with a biblical worldview as it applies to technology. In other words, we can't simply lift moral precepts from one context, from the Christian worldview, and try to inject them into our modern secular culture. Instead, we have to show people the whole picture and try to persuade them that the biblical picture of reality with its corresponding ethics simply makes a better sense out of life. So let me begin by painting a picture of what the biblical picture is as it applies specifically to technology and the relationship to moral principles. We have to start by understanding historically that technology, modern technology, has its roots firmly in a Christian worldview. Several historians have noted this, uh, both Christian and secular historians, that modern science itself rests on certain foundational assumptions that were provided by Christian beliefs, such as the assumption that the world has an orderly and rational structure because it was created by a rational God coupled with the assumption that we can discover that order because we are created in God's image. But the next step, the application of science to practical problems through technology, depended on three additional principles that also were derived from Christian belief. The first is that the universe is contingent and that it can be changed. To understand what contingency means and how important it was historically, we have to go back to the ancient Greeks. The Greeks taught that nature was teleological, that is, that it was imbued with inherent rational purposes. 
that a tree or a rock had its own nature and its own purpose, and that once you understood the purpose, you could logically deduce what its properties have to be. Now, to many Christians, this seems to be quite compatible with Christian belief, but others weren't so sure. If if things had their own intrinsic purpose, that seemed to imply that God himself was limited and could not change them. For example, in the late Middle Ages, there were many Christian Aristotelians who argued that the nature of the heavens demanded circular motion for the stars and the planets by an inner law of rational necessity, which seemed to imply that God himself could not have made the orbits any other way, that matter had prescribed properties that God himself could not change. In the 13th century, a protest arose in a theology known as voluntarism. Voluntarism emphasized God's power and freedom to create the world according to his own will and his own purposes. Natural laws were not rational purposes within nature. They were divine commands imposed from outside nature by a transcendent God. The order of the universe is not intrinsic or logically necessary. It is bestowed by God, and if he wants to, he can change that order. He could have even created a different world with a different order from the one that exists. The universe is not rationally necessary as the Greeks taught. It is contingent upon the free and transcendent will of God. This idea proved to be historically a powerful influence on the development of technology. The Greek view had led to a passivity in the face of nature. Nature be- could be contemplated, but it could not be changed or manipulated. Contingency, on the other hand, implied an active role for human beings. Uh, Historian Christopher Kaiser, in a book called Creation and the History of Science, puts it this way. Things do not have to continue as they are now, because their existence depends on a God who created them from nothing, and who can therefore transform them as he will. This conviction opened the door to a whole new level of creative manipulation of natural objects. The Greeks looked for purposes in nature, but the early modern scientists asked how they could impose their own purposes on nature. They set out to analyze, for example, the properties of wood in a tree or the minerals in a rock and creatively think up new ways that people might make use of these qualities. The idea of contingency allowed the human mind to conceive the possibility of a radical change. History was not cyclical, the endless return of the same thing. It was linear. In the course of time, God can create things that are radically new, and so can human beings who are made in his image. They can invent. They can innovate. They can discover new uses for natural forces. Uh, so that's my first principle from the Christianity that was important for an important intellectual presupposition for the development of technology. The second intellectual presupposition, uh, which was also derived from Christian belief, concerns the nature of human beings and human knowledge. In many religious traditions, the divine, God, is imminent in the universe. Whether it's thought of as many deities inhabiting the rivers and the, and the woods as an animism, or whether it's a single spirit permeating all things as in pantheism, the divine is a quality of something in the universe. The, the universe itself is the all-encompassing reality. In this context, human beings are also completely imminent in nature. The way that cultures commonly express this is with totems and idols, where humans are connected to the creatures of the natural world in a bond of spiritual kinship. The imminent form of spirituality generates an intellectual stance that is passive over against nature. The human mind is embedded in nature and cannot transcend it as a subject over against objects. The goal of knowledge is merely to adapt and conform to nature. There's no concept of harnessing nature's forces for practical ends. But the Bible begins with a transcendent God and with humans created in his image. Here humans find their essential kinship not with nature, but with God. We are his representatives, extending his dominion over creation, as Genesis puts it. As a result, the human mind is capable of transcending nature and confronting it as subjects against objects. The human mind is active in nature. We don't seek knowledge merely to conform to nature. We are free to manipulate nature, both conceptually in in mathematical formulas and practically in experiments. We have now in place 
institutions of physicians that were necessary for modern technology. Historically speaking, the concept of a world susceptible to change and human beings capable of changing it. The third precondition for modern technology was a moral sanction. And of course, once again, that came from Christianity. From the time of the early church, Christians have stressed the practical arts as a means of reversing the destructive effects of the fall into sin and the curse on nature recorded in Genesis 3. Knowledge was considered a gift of God for alleviating toil and suffering. I'd like to flesh this out with a few examples from history. In the 4th century, Basel, Bishop of Caesarea, founded history's first hospital that was open to the public on a regular basis. He also organized relief for famine victims. His theological rationale was twofold. Number one, because God had created the world, there's a possibility of radical change. The God who created can also restore. This is the ongoing lesson of the biblical miracles of healing, according to Basel. Second, God's people are called to participate in this ministry of help and healing, not necessarily in miracles, but in acts of charity. What we see here is that even before the scientific revolution, Christian scholars were giving the technical arts a theological justification and a positive value that they did not have either in ancient Greek or ancient Jewish culture. During the scientific revolution, this theme was, if anything, intensified. The writings of the early modern scientists are permeated with con religious concern for the poor and the sick, which you don't often get in your secular history books, by the way. The application of science for the improvement of the human condition was considered a religious duty, a matter of Christian charity. Cotton Mather in 1654 wrote, to, to study the nature and course and the use of all God's works is a duty imposed by God. To use a phrase that the early scientists loved, the study of God's word should be to glorify God and to benefit human beings. Technology was always firmly embedded within a matrix that regarded it as a servant of moral and charitable purposes. Uh, one of my own favorite examples from history is that in the 16th century, a man named Paracelsus was trained as a physician and pioneered the use of chemistry in medicine. Paracelsus was a devout Christian and derived his medical calling from two biblical principles. First, he believed that Christ's victory over death meant that all illnesses could eventually be healed, an idea that may not sound all that novel in our own age of miracle drugs, but in Paracelsus' day, it was revolutionary. The impetus for scientific research, he taught, was to fulfill the ministry of healing and restoration that was ordained by Christ. Second, Paracelsus argued that loving our neighbors as ourselves means doing all we can through the creative and the technical arts to help our neighbors. Reformers stood in the same tradition. Martin Luther viewed the human arts as a means for restoring, at least in part, Adam's dominion over creation. He saw scientists as co-workers with God in his own creative activity. In fact, Luther anticipated that religious reformation, which he ended up having quite a hand in, would lead, natural, would lead naturally to a new era of scientific and technological progress. Luther and Calvin both wrote about uh, the sciences of their day and argued that the Christian ideal of charity and service should always be applied to the arts and sciences. They should not be used for personal ambitions but to promote the public good. One more example, a man who was often credited or blamed, as the case may be, as one of the prime movers in the development of modern technology was Francis Bacon because he repeatedly stressed Hume's mastery over nature. But what we hear about less often is that Bacon, too, believed the purpose of science was to restore Adam's original dominion over nature, a restoration that he saw foreshadowed in Jesus' own miracles of healing, of healing diseases and subduing the forces of nature. Um, as a result, Adam, uh, Bacon, Bacon urged that the arts and sciences were actually dependent on the grace of God and must always be accompanied by prayer. In other words, to sum up what we've gone through so far, that Christianity provided the intellectual and the moral basis for the incredible explosion of creativity that we associate with the scientific revolution and with the industrial revolution and with modern technology. Um, and we can learn a lot from these historical figures and their understanding of the complete Christian worldview and how it applies to our problems today. Of course, many of the problems we will face today are quite new.
And yet many of them echo the same themes that technology has raised from the beginning of the Christian era. As the letter, of Hebrews put it, the letter to Hebrews puts it, we do have a cloud of witnesses to encourage us as we meet here today. As we trace these ideas over time, though, they become secularized. And I'd like to switch gears now and paint a picture of contemporary liberalism over against the biblical worldview. And ironically, in many ways, it's actually a child, or perhaps a stepchild, of Christianity in the sense that it took many of the Christian ideas and wrenched them out of context. For example, the idea of contingency, that nature is malleable and nature can be changed, has, has today degenerated into a philosophy of unrestricted human mastery. The universe has been reduced in modern liberalism to an endless chain of contingent events with no meaning, no goal, no final truth. A new book uh, by David Roberts of the University of Chicago is called Nothing But History, and the, the title alone is a succinct summary of the book's theme. In postmodern philosophy, Roberts says, there is nothing but history. The world is ever provisional. We are caught up in endless history. A contingent world is now understood as one without any moral order to which we must submit. There's only a constant flux of uninterpreted events, of history, which we are free to master according to our own purposes. This notion of radical contingency was applied first, of course, to the natural sciences and then to the social sciences. Uh, in the words of George Grant, who was a Canadian philosopher and Christian, if science was about the mastery of nature, the human sciences were about the mastery of human nature. Human nature came to be seen as something to be conquered, controlled, and changed. Values came to be seen as something we freely create in our attempt to master our personal and social world. Of course, even the term value has a subjective con connotation compared with the older term, which was goodness. Value is something I confer on something, not something, not a quality that it has objectively. It's something I create, not something I discover. So George Grant warns us that modern liberalism is incapable of providing any moral direction to modern technology because both grow from the same soil, from a secular ideal of creative mastery that acknowledges no given cosmic or moral order, but open vistas of constant creating and recreating of both our world and ourselves. So as I close, I'd like to suggest that as we go on throughout the conference to look at specific medical and ethical questions, let's bear in mind these bigger questions, the big picture, the overall worldviews that are in conflict. And I'd like to suggest two ways that this will strengthen our hand. First, Christians often make the mistake of taking individual moral principles, like abortion is wrong, and we extract these principles from the biblical worldview that makes sense of them and we proclaim them in the public sphere. As a result, the principles appear to be merely arbitrary rules. We, are, we ourselves come across as moralists who are trying to impose our private preferences by force. I would suggest that we would do better in our public communication if we can find ways to communicate moral principles within an overall and integrated system of belief. And in doing this, again, we can look at, learn a lot from our historical forebears who tended to have a much more holistic view of the faith. Second, I suggest we can develop a new apologetic by pointing out that much of what is attractive and beneficial in modern culture has its roots in Christianity. And if we, uh, if we want to keep it as beneficial and attractive, we need to keep it within that matrix. This contingency of nature, which spurred so much of modern science and technology, in a Christian understanding, simply meant that the order of the universe is open to reordering by God and by human beings. But torn from its Christian roots, contingency has come to mean there's no enduring or stable order in the world. Everything is an evolutionary flux. Even nature's stable patterns, what we call the laws of nature, are regarded as merely handles for manipulating natural objects. Today, of course, with the possibility of manipulating human genes, this secular notion of contingency will inevitably lead to the conclusion that there's no moral order, no natural order that we're obligated to respect. There are no constraints on our urge to tinker and change. When people begin to realize the dangers in that kind of unrestricted freedom, 
we get to craft a powerful apologetic to call them back to the Christian understanding of nature and of human nature. The positive benefits of the idea of a contingent universe instead of a necessary or deterministic universe, the, the creative freedom that, that that unleashes will flourish only within a Christian framework that also places ethical limits on human creativity. Otherwise, contingency will lead not to freedom, ironically, but to control, as some people develop the technology to submit other people to genetic control and manipulation. Consider also the Christian notion of charity, of healing and restoration that so long guided the development of technology. Paul Taylor, in his book, Sources of the Self, says that the Christian teaching on charity has been secularized to an ideal of universal benevolence. Torn from its biblical roots, benevolence has dissolved into a vague and formless ideal, to quote the late moral philosopher Alistair McIntyre. Unlike charity, benevolence as a virtue became a license for almost any kind of manipulative intervention in the affairs of others. You and I may talk in ominous terms, ominous terms of a brave new world, but believe me, the geneticists and medical researchers who are busy developing the technologies that could create the brave new world are convinced that they're acting out of pure benevolence. To illustrate the point, I will end as I began with a story from the conference I attended a few months ago on gene patenting, uh, which is a small conference in Washington, D.C. Ben Mitchell was there. Um, and you, you can tell me whether you got this impression also, Ben. Among the participants there were a handful of presidents and CEOs of uh, major companies that are actually conducting gene research for commercial use. And for me, anyway, listening to these captains of industry was a real eye-opener. You and I probably hobnob mostly with other believers. We read mostly the writings of theologians and Christian ethicists. And we really don't have a clue how the people think who are pursuing this work for commercial purposes. The, co the corporation men at this conference, at least, were utterly convinced that everything they are doing is for benevolent purposes. Some of the Christian theologians and ethicists around the table tried to get them to consider that maybe certain technologies could lead to undesirable effects, to the commercialization of the human body, to various forms of genetic determinism, or the reduction of human life to consumerist values. But all the talk fell on deaf ears. The men from these genetic research companies seemed totally convinced that if genetic tinkering helps people feel better and be happier, that is by definition benevolent, and how could anyone possibly object? So this is a challenge before us. It's not so much that we are besieged by cartoon-style mad scientists who are out to create Frankenstein. If the genetic revolution gives birth to a nightmare, it will be the work of committed researchers who are wholly sincere, wholly convinced that they are doing us good. If we stand firm in the biblical meaning of charity, steeped in an understanding from church history, only then will we be able to withstand this candy-coated totalitarianism and, with God's grace, even to overcome it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have some opportunity now for questions to Nancy Piercy. We have two microphones in the aisles here. And if you would like to make your way to a mic, uh, this is your opportunity. Thank you, Nancy, for your presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, you've amply illustrated the historical uh, basis of the idea that Christianity originated um, technological development. I'm curious if you've looked into the actual reasoning process uh, from biblical sources that uh, the early people who developed these presuppositions that you spoke of um, regarding technology being the best way to be benevolent. Uh, if, you, if you've looked into the specific verses and principles that um, those developers that you spoke of, Bacon was one, uh, that the people in that period worked from. Is that clear enough? You want me to restate the question? Well, have I done the biblical exposition? Well, and well you, you obviously haven't done one today. But what I'm curious 
uh, with is have you have you looked at what what actual biblical logic these uh, these early thinkers used to justify the idea that technological uh, advancement was the best way to be benevolent in in that world. Uh, well, I'm not a theologian. I'm my background is history of science. So no, I have looked mostly at the histor at the historical figures and how they argued and what they wrote, but I haven't done an independent you know, theological analysis, if that's what you're looking for, um, of their arguments and whether I agree with them and whether that's, uh, I'm not sure that they would say that that's the only way to fulfill the command to be benevolent by any means, but um, you might be overstating it a bit there. But no, I haven't looked at the, at the actual, um, you know, at the biblical analysis of exegesis, if, if that's what you're asking. Now, in fact, I've, one of the things that was uh, frustrating for me as I uh, was preparing this is that there are very few Christians writing on the history of technology and um, very few Christians writing on technology per se. There was very little out there, and what was out there was sort of, um, you know, very pragmatic. What principles can we use to guide us right now today? Um, there's very little historical and logical um, analysis at all by Christians on the subject of technology and where did it come from and how, what's good and what's bad. Thank you. Yeah. Jay Holman, Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana. Thank you very much. I, I am a little confused now about what is the modern man thinking. You talked about the benevolence of the uh, philanthropist or the, the, the industrial people, and then you talk about also, at least you touch on, the reductionism that man is just a bunch of molecules and we're all programmed to do different things and we're all a part of nature and we flow with nature. And then, of course, this dominance of nature concept too. Is, it, is modern man kind of a mixture of all those things, or how would you characterize him now? Yeah, I, I figured someone would ask that. <laughs> I almost put it in. Um, in some ways, what we have today is a conflict between the Enlightenment view and the postmodern view. The Enlightenment view, which is still very mechanistic and reductionistic and deterministic, is, is a heritage from the Greeks in some ways. I talked about the Greeks having a very necessary view of, nat of nature, that had the, logic, the structures of nature were necessary. Um, well, you can trace a direct relationship from the Greek understanding of mathematics to Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, and the, the giants of modern science. Although they were Christians, they took a, a basically Pythagorean view of, of um, mathematics. And as a result, modern science, which is very, uh, very much uh, mathematical, incorporates um, a deterministic understanding that if something can be reduced to mathematical formulas, it therefore has the same uh, necessary quality as five plus seven equals 12. Um, that physical laws uh, are like mathematical laws. So the, the heritage from the Enlightenment was very much deterministic, reductionistic, and in some ways the, the Greek view lives on. Um, and the postmodern view, uh, the postmodern view, however, um, well, the, the culture wars but on the campuses today is very much between the Enlightenment and the postmodernism. So you, today we still have some of each. A lot of secular conservatives, um, for example, are very much influenced by the Enlightenment still, and they're trying to retain that sort of rational optimism that the Enlightenment had. Postmodernism um, has given up the notion of any kind of truth, any kind of order. So yes, we actually face both of those, and probably a lot of people here, if you're working in the sciences, are still facing uh, a mindset very much framed by the Enlightenment. If you're here in ethics and uh, literature and history, then you're facing an intellectual climate that's very postmodernist. So you do, we do have both. Related question to what he was saying. Um, it seems like today we as Christians are caught between uh, an attitude of, you, you explained that uh, Christianity gives the intellectual and moral basis of much of the technology that we enjoy. And uh, we need to explain to people that that's where the roots are. And yet there's another movement of that all technology is bad. And therefore Christianity is seen because of its roots um, as being an enemy almost. And how do, we, how do we counter both of those? Both explain it as a, a good thing to people, but also counter the back to nature 
people who are against all technology, and Sue Christianity is the root of that. Yeah, um, that's, that's another thing I hope someone would ask. <laughs> um, as I was doing the historical uh, study of this, the sequence of ideas, um, I saw, I saw it, you could see it change historically. The high view of technology as a gift of God, as a, you know, as a, as a wonderful tool for helping people and expressing Christian charity. Um, as culture secularizes, you lose that. You, view, uh, you lose that high view of morality and, I mean, of technology. And the reason is because the link between technology and morality is broken. As soon as the link between technology and morality is broken, obviously then technology begins to be used for immoral or non-benevolent purposes. Um, and you can see it historically beginning with um, 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 Samuel Johnson in Rasselas has, uh, describes the scientist as, as sort of a, almost a contemporary mad scientist who's mad with knowledge um, and wants to take the place of God. You can see it in William Blake and with that famous phrase in one of his poems about the dark satanic mills. Um, th that's the beginning of the shift as people begin to have a, a, a fearsome view of technology. So the answer we give to people is, yes, it had Christian roots, but my goodness, um, secularism is real too. And as, as secularism took root, um, technology did in fact degenerate into, be, into being used um, thoughtlessly and irresponsibly. And we're right with the critics on that one. I teach uh, bioethics, and I was uh, particularly interested in your opening story of the students who intuitively knew right from wrong but had no rationale to justify it. And in my attempt at um, developing different methods of teaching, uh, I've tried to provide that rationale, of course. I'm interested in the feedback you may have had either over your broadcasting uh, uh, ways of getting feedback or in your speaking to people whether in fact people are open to a, uh, an understanding of history, philosophy, a rational justification for their intuitive sense of right and wrong, whether that makes any difference in a postmodern age. Uh, that's the challenge I've had, is moving students from feelings to thought. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and you're right, we're in a postmodern age and a lot of people don't care about rationality. But the postmodern age also gives us some tools that we can deal with that. Um, Stanley Hauerwas and Alistair McIntyre and others who um, who talk about stories and narratives. Um, in one sense, that can be read as very relativistic. You know, you've got your story and I've got mine, and there's no point of contact. The others, on the other hand, um, it's really what uh, Van Til and other presuppositionalists have been saying all along, and that is, um, Christianity is a coherent system. Every system of thought is a coherent system on its own. Um, that starts with certain presuppositions and moves from there. So I think um, I, I think that Christians can take advantage of a postmodern um, environment in the sense that we can come back and say, yeah, we have a story. Our ra it's not a pure abstract rationality that we preach. It is a story that you know God created things. It starts with creation, which is a very dramatic story. You know, the fall into sin, which is a great tragedy. Milton's, you know, go back to the great poets who've, who've seen the story, the drama in, the, in Christianity. Dorothy Sayers has that wonderful phrase, uh, the, the dogma is the drama, or is it the drama is the dogma? But, but anyway, it's, it's dramatic. Uh, it is a story. And so I think you're right. We need to argue for rational grounds, but we also have to realize it's a whole person there. And Christianity applies, of course, and appeals to much more than our rationality. The rationality is a component of this dramatic story that appeals to the whole person, the imagination, and the, and the emotions. Francis Collins from the National Center for Human Genome Research. Uh, I'm intrigued by your statement, and I completely agree with it, how little has been written on this topic by Christians on the topic of technology. Uh, talking to Chuck Colson, he uh, told me that when he has a program on the radio on bioethics, particularly when it comes to genetics, the phones go dead. People just are not that interested in calling in or even hearing about this topic. Uh, you're a historian of science. Uh, when you look back on situations where scientific revolutions were underway, and I believe one is now underway in molecular biology and genetics, the history of the church's involvement is not always a pretty one. On the one hand, there may be instances where the church paints themselves into a corner 
by denying certain uh, scientific observations which eventually become undeniable, as if somehow they had to defend God against scientists' intrusions into his existence, which is a rather bizarre concept that somehow God would be threatened by science. Uh, or in other instances, I think the church has just not gotten engaged. Um, I think both those possibilities now exist for genetics. This uh, conference we're having here is an antidote to that, but obviously the number of people here are, is a limited one. And my sense is, and I'd be interested in yours as well, is that up until now, uh, people of serious Christian faith have not really engaged in a meaningful, productive way in these debates about genetics, but rather have been worried about it, uh, have perhaps made strong negative statements about it, have not necessarily gathered the information about the specifics, which is often where the arguments ought to reside, rather in the, than in the generalities. Looking back upon the history of science and the church, uh, do you perceive a way that we could be more effective this time in engaging people of faith in these arguments? Because I think if we don't, uh, the consequences are going to be troubling. Um, historically, um, it's simply not true that Christians weren't involved in the sciences of their day. Um, yes, if you, can look, if you look back at theologians, um, uh, Martin Luther and Calvin didn't have a whole lot to say about the Copernican Revolution, um, and some people fault them for that, but they were theologians. Um, the thing is, people, Christians were in the professions. The theologians could stick to theology because the Christians were out there in the sciences. <laughs> Not anymore. You know, right, right. But the, at the, historically speaking, uh, Christians uh, developed um, a lot of the rationales for technology that I mentioned briefly here because Christians were actually in the professions, in the scientific professions, and doing the work. Um, incidentally, I, I think Christians sometimes get a bit of a bum rap from secular historians um, who, who like to hit on people like the reformers for not being more up on the science of their day. Um, and I think we should be aware when we hear that in our classrooms that that's often a distortion. The reason uh, Luther and Calvin weren't um, particularly excited about Copernicus, the Copernican um, you know, solar system, understanding of the solar system, which were the, the planetary system, um, was because it hadn't been proved at the time. There wasn't enough uh, empirical data to really prove it at the time. It was not generally accepted, and the theologians not being scientists, tended to accept what the science of their day was. The science of their day was hostile to Copernicus, so they were. Um, it's not that Christians are particularly hostile to science, historically speaking at least. Christians have not been more, more hostile than the rest of the culture. But uh, that's a parenthetical note. We shouldn't let the secularists make us, paint us as being more hostile than we have been historically. But the real answer is that Christians were in the professions. And what happened in our modern day, since it's approximately since the days of fundamentalism in the 1920s, is that Christians retreated when, um, well, and not just in science, but when science appeared to be hostile to Christianity uh, through the work of people like Darwin, Christians simply left the sciences. When uh, Marx made it seem that politics and economics was hostile to Christianity, Christians just got out of those fields. When Freud turned, made psychology appear to be hostile to Christian faith, Christians simply retreated. So Christians left the professions, all but the very practical ones like engineering. <laughs> um, and that's what we're dealing with. Christians are not in the professions. I don't think it's really the job of theologians um, to be working out these areas uh, in detail. They should be giving the biblical framework, but in detail, it should be people in the professions. And we are fighting against a trend that began with fundamentalism, which we are now hoping to reverse. But if, if I can just follow up, if and I accept your statement completely, uh, the proportion of working scientists, particularly in, say, genetics, uh, who will admit uh, to being practicing Christians is really quite low, and the proportion that are serious about it is even lower. Uh, if that element is now not making a contribution, yes. uh, how will this point of view be made? Yes, good point. Uh, and maybe the answer is we have to think of that long term. We, uh, the, the example Chuck Colson gave last night of the, of the student in molecular biology who said, I, I, need to be, I want to be a missionary. Do you remember the story? I do. I feel that way myself frequently. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
Well, he thought he had to leave molecular biology, remember. Originally, yeah. he thought he had to leave his field and go off uh, into, into a, you know, specific missionary work. And Chuck it urged him to consider that molecular biology is a mission field. The long haul, over the long haul, that is the only way to change the professions. You cannot do it from outside, haranguing them moralistically from outside. We're not really haranguing, but that's how it seems. Outsiders can't change it. Insiders, it has to be insiders.